folks, welcome to The Gifted Ones, and I'm your host, Liz Throp. Today we have a very special treat for you. We are joining one of Canada's very extraordinary and a celebrity in her own right, psychic mediums. Some of you may recognize her from her recent tour that she just did with James Van Prague across North America. I'm talking about Jay Lane, who is joining us today via Zoom. Welcome, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me here today. I'm really excited. Oh, I'm the one that's super pumped about this. I'm just going to get going on this interview because I've got a lot of good questions to ask you. But let me introduce you. Internationally renowned and Canada's rising star, psychic medium Jay Lane is sought after on a daily basis from her long list of celebrity A-list clientele and individuals from all over the world. Acclaimed for her accuracy, honesty, and readiness to tell it like it is, Jay Lane has addressed audiences, audiences of thousands with her concise, inspirational, motivational, and jaw-dropping details from the spirit world. Gifted from birth, Jay suffered a near-death drowning at the age of four that raised her awareness and changed her life as a result of what she has now learned about the other side. Jay's life mission is helping others see and see life in a different light. Jay uses her gift and abilities to enlighten and change lives of those around her. Welcome to the Gifted Ones. Oh, thank you so much, Liz. Jeez, I feel so important when you see. Ah, well, you are important. Are you kidding me? I I have to say, um, you know, just super super excited i've been doing research on you obviously um you know when i do interviews i do some research and you're just your story is amazing first and foremost and that kind of leads to the first question that i have to ask you about um we mentioned in your bio that you had a near-death experience at the age of four can you share what that experience was like with all of us and and how that happened like what exactly went down there yes actually i was um we we flew to my uncle's camp my uncle and my dad had planes and my uncle owned a lodge it was quite big actually wow. and it was uh it was many years ago i was about i was close to four years old and we had gone out there because my uncle wanted to change the roofs on some of the little cottages because they were leaking and so my dad my mom and my brother and i had flown out to camp, um, you know, for about a week. And, you know, we were younger, so my mom had to have us around and uh, didn't want to get a babysitter. But my brother and I had gone up on the hill. We weren't supposed to go there, first of all. Huh. We had gone up on the hill, and we were playing Evil Knievel. I love it. <laughs> yes, we were. We all so played he, that game. <laughs> <laughs> he, had my, um, he had my cousin Norman's bike, which was a bigger tricycle, and I had my cousin Carol's little tricycle because the kids weren't there. And so we we borrowed their toys, of course, and we were racing down this hill. And so he went around the corner and he had told me to take my feet off the pedals because they were going really fast. And, you know, I wasn't going fast enough at first and my knees were hitting the handlebars because the bike was too small for me. Yeah. And so it was a very small tricycle. So he told, told me to put my feet out and the pedals started to go too quickly. So I started going down the hill really quickly. So he told me, quick, turn, turn, turn. So when I turned the handlebar, all I remember is tumbling. And the thing is, the handlebar went into the ribs. And mm. I knew right away that I was in a lot of pain. But I don't remember much except for falling off the Sevenfin into the lake and uh, the lake below, which was quite far. And um, I stayed there until my brother went down the rest of the hill, ran to the camp, told my mother that I had fallen off the embankment. So they thought I fell onto a little pile of rocks. There's the embankment has, um, as my parents explained, sort of like a, a little ledge and then it goes off. But I fell. I really went flying, wow. so I was lucky I didn't hit that, but I was underwater for a bit. All I really remember from that is hitting pretty hard and seeing the bottom of the lake. I still remember it being all murky and yucky and, and not being able to breathe. I mean, I still remember feeling like I had uh, needles going throughout my whole body, and I struggled for air. I, I, I couldn't breathe. It was just water coming in my lungs, and then I 
I told my mother I had a dream. I saw the sunshine come through the water and pick me up. Mm -hmm. And then I met my grandpa and my brother. And so I knew them. I I told her, I, I said, I, I know them. And she says, I don't understand what you're talking about. So when I came to, I told her about my dream. But it was actually my grandfather who had died in 1952 and my brother who had died in 53 wow. that I met. And so I'd never known them in this lifetime. But um, from that day forward, I kind of knew that, you know, I was different because of the things I was hearing. I wasn't hearing normally. For years, they thought it was just the lake water um, seeped into the ears because you get right. lung infections from the lake. Um, I had gotten a really bad lung infection. I was in the hospital for a bit. And my ears, of course, were, were a bit infected on the one side, especially. So they thought it was just from the lake water that I was hearing these, like, I was explaining to my mother, I was hearing these chirps. I didn't know how to explain it. Right. So I only spoke French at the time. Yeah. And, um, but it, it, for me, it's like, it's still there. And it's almost like, it's like, I understand it. It's just the weirdest thing. I, yeah. I can't even explain. It. Yeah. <laughs> so it's true. Um, so from there, you know, nothing really happened to me until I was about nine, but I was kind of, I, I kind of knew I was different at that point or something had changed with me. You know, and it's funny, you're, you're just a kid, but you kind of know, you know? Yeah. It's, no, I yeah. totally remember um, being a child and thinking, I know I'm different, but I don't know why or how. That was my confusion. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think I just assumed everybody thought the same way or had the same insight. And it really bothered me that people didn't use their intellect, which I saw as intellect, which would have obviously been insight that we had as a young child um yes. it used to bother me i used to think why do they not how do they not know that how do they not think of that like i'm a kid how do they not know that so yeah that's very interesting but wow what an experience mm. for you you know i was lucky though because you know Liz, my, my mother was a practicing psychic uh between 1961 and 83 so she quickly recognized you know that um, there was something different with me as well, but really yeah. never paid heed to it. Just kind of right. left it there, you know? Right, right. It's well, it, it was like back in those yeah. days, right? Like, uh, let's face it, when we were younger, this being a psychic or a medium was not thought cool. of the same way. It wasn't cool. It was kind of, you were kind of freaky, right? So we Absolutely. were kind of kept quiet or hidden, so to speak, right? Well, it's you know, now. my mother always used to say, they, they treat me like a witch, but they're all lined up at my door for readings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love people. that. That's so it's great. True. That's so it's true. true. So true. wanted to know stuff, so they would line up. But yeah, she yeah. was really popular, my mom. So yeah, I was very lucky to have been mentored by her. No kidding. Well, I'm so glad that uh, they got you out of the lake in time. And, and what a beautiful experience to have met your grandfather and your brother how lovely is that and are they inspirational yeah. now to you like do you do they stay in touch all the time still or my grandfather is funny follows me around my brother I haven't seen since and it's, i've never felt him um i've never seen him since but i knew he was my brother when i saw him he was my age but my mother said he died when he was six months old ah. so it, it's funny i i didn't recognize him as a baby i, right. I recognized him as being my age which was really weird but i even knew his name and it was something they didn't really talk about yeah you know? yeah uh now as an adult you can see intellectually what that all meant but at the age of four that must have come with some serious challenges for both you and your folks. Can you share now how your parents and you both dealt with that? You know, learning well, the experiences? That's such a great question. It's never been asked of me, so thank you. Oh, um, yeah. But I'm gonna tell you, my mother was great with it and she recognized early that I was gifted and she always told me God's influence flows through. That's what a gift is. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, but my dad, Hated it, hated it. Um, you know, he didn't have a problem with her being a psychic and doing her tea leaf readings and doing these types of things because so she was making money and she was using a tool, which was tea leaves. But right. with me, I didn't have tools. Right. Um, the very first experience I had of seeing a human spirit was in a grocery store when I was nine. 
and I got the look of my life that day. Mm. But the thing is, I understand it now. I didn't understand it then. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, your dad was so mean. I think my dad was protective, you know, and he didn't want me being hurt because back then he used to tell me, be quiet. People are going to think you're crazy. They'll lock you up, you know. But when I was nine, I saw my first human spirit in a grocery store, and it scared me. Uh, because I, A, recognized what it was, but it wasn't what I felt with it because I was overwhelmed with this feeling of love, which at nine years old, yeah. you're not really supposed to know what all that is. No, no. And the thing is, it was so strong, and I started crying in this grocery lineup. We were at the uh, cash register waiting to, you know, go through with our order. And uh, this lady was in front of me, and I could see a man clearly trying to tell her to eat and he kept on calling her twin and he was speaking French to her. I can still remember twin foot smash, foot smash. And that's a nickname, twin, you know? Okay. So I told her, twin foot smash. Jerry eat foot smash. Like so I told her, Jerry said you have to eat. And she turned around, she goes, Are you talking to me? So I said, Are you Irene? <laughs> she said, Yes. <laughs> she said yes. And I was falling and my dad grabbed me by the collar and he told me, Shut up. So my, well, that's okay. You know, know. Uh, you know, it, it's okay. So he told me to be quiet. I don't remember much except for when we got home, but he told me three reasons I was getting a lick in. Number one, you never talk to strangers ever. Number two, whatever's coming out of your mouth, people are going to think you're crazy, yeah. you know? And number three, people don't believe in that stuff. So you have to be quiet. Okay, so I was quiet for many years after that because, yeah. you know, I was told that I was going to be locked up in North Bay. And I don't know if you know the geographical area here, but I'm from Sudbury and North Bay is where the um, psychiatric ward is. But I didn't know that until I was 15. Okay. So it resonates with you, you know. Of course it does. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so growing up a little bit different, my mother was fully accepting. Uh, you know, as I grew older, she started to develop me a lot more as to, to trust my feelings because I was so focused on trying to find out how I did this stuff. And yeah. and she told me it didn't matter, just that's to trust right. it. Yeah, you know? that's right. <laughs> yeah, and then I had a dad who tell me to be quiet and like not show that part of myself because it would be embarrassing to the family. That must have been so, such a conflict for both your parents. Right? It, For, it was. Yeah. Because mother practiced. And so she goes, What's wrong? I'm doing it. What's wrong with her doing it? And he goes, No. He says, that She does it without anything, and that's wrong. He says, You know, can't people are going to think that she's possessed or something. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. And did your father have like a strong religious background or? No. no. So it, it was just belief systems that were thrown out there. You know, um, my dad was mad because my my mother had lost this little boy at six months, and my dad turned against religion at that point. Uh, and I think that that had a lot to do with it. But my mother was very religious, but my mother was shunned by the Catholic Church. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. Such an unfortunate. I I think there there's so much more acceptance now um, from people that are in religious things. I don't want it to go into that direction with this interview, but it kind of yes. explains, you know, belief systems and how how they affect us um, when we're not willing to investigate or learn what things are about. And clearly, you know, your gift is so magical that it had to shine no matter what, even though you were repressed as a, as a child, because that's how I kind of look at it, right? Which happens yes. still to this day, right? There are young ones out there that are, you know, dealing with that. So I yes. guess I should get to, to the next question. Um, what was life like for you seeing and communicating with the dead in school? And what coping skills did you learn to use? So while you were in, say, public or, or high school even? Well, there was, um, there was a person that was murdered in our schoolyard when I was younger. And I remember seeing this woman. She was a grounded spirit. Right. And she always smiled. But she'd always stand by the stage in the, in, the, in the gymnasium. I never saw her anywhere else. So I assumed growing up that she might have been a teacher in that area. Um, but she had died. She was murdered in the schoolyard wow. during the summertime. And so that was a, a big one for me. Uh, until I was in grade four. Um, but the thing is, um, after that, you know, it was high school that was difficult for me, I think, because mm -hmm. a lot of the teachers that I taught there, um, some of them 
they go back, right? They revisit their lives. Like I see grounded spirits, but I also see, you know, other types of energies. So it was kind of weird. But the hardest thing for me was the kids that were negative because yes. I found negative energy around them. Yeah. And I had a hard time coping with that because I'm such a, uh, I, I guess I feel other people's pain and feelings. So it was difficult for me because there was, especially in high school, there's so much conflict with kids, oh, yeah. you know, in their own emotional turmoils that um I, I think that it really helped me though understand people at a very deep level even at a young age you know but it was tougher in high school yeah you know? I definitely so found much. that too I found that as yeah. well um high school was and I and actually talking to a lot of folks like us um what I've discovered is that it seems to be that we all generally got along with pretty much everybody, but we didn't belong to any sort of clique, right? So we weren't like a part of the sports team or like the jock team. Like even though I did a lot of sports, I never hung out with that specific group. I basically, yeah. I had, I think one friend in high school that even that was at a limit. Like I, I had like my arm up all the time, like back off just as yeah. a protective thing, because like you, it's daunting when you're it, feeling the energies, especially of high school students. Yeah, I found it difficult in high school. And, and the fact that some of the kids really knew how I was, they knew about my mother. And my mother was Beatrice, psychic Beatrice. So they used to call me Psycho Betty. So, of course, you get bullied a lot, you know. Yep. And uh, people think, oh, you could read minds. They didn't understand what a psychic yes. or a was. And back then, really, I never labeled myself as a psychic or a medium. You know, it was just actually 15 years ago that someone said, you're a psychic medium. <laughs> yeah. And you use that as your title because I honestly didn't know how to classify myself. Yeah, I had the same, same thing with me. It wasn't until one of my clients said, no, you're a psychic, Liz. And I'm like, no, let's not go there. Because I think I had that image of like the old woman with the crystal ball and the turban on her <laughs> head, right? I was like, I am not that. that person. Hysterical. But, uh, you know, very interesting. So... That's, you know, that's, I think a lot of people watching this will resonate with that who are um, gifted um, yeah. that, you know, maybe they have kids in school that are, are experiencing overwhelm. Like, I don't know about you, but I used to spend a lot of time on my own. Um, yes. I used to hang out in my room a lot. Yeah. Um, yes. I would need like days sometimes to, uh, to not, and I was social. I just couldn't I, connect with people yeah. like one on one. I just needed time away all the time. Was that the same for you? Well, I did a lot of horseback riding and I sang. Uh, I did too. It was <laughs> and I had joined the band, but I was always with the boys. And then people didn't like that, but I was just a really straight lace square as they say it yeah. and, and the thing is um, it was the perception of people because people are afraid of people when they don't understand stuff so okay. they call me psycho Betty or they do different things but I didn't take it personal my mother always taught me you know what people think of you is none of your business anyways. that's right yeah yeah so when you grow up she says they'll all be lined up at your door yeah. so she says the same thing with me and, and it's true they all came to my door yeah. so yeah. later on so all of these people in high school who thought I was crazy um I've read for most of them so <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's so funny. Yeah. Same here. Okay, so if there's a kid watching right now experiencing um, some of the same challenges, what, what advice would you give them? Well, you know, I always, I love working with kids and I did a lot of videos on, you know, coping with gifts for children and different things like that. But I always tell them to write things down when they feel something and when it happens they're not crazy. And the things my mother taught me to write stuff down and it really validates a lot of stuff because the thing is it gets you to trust yourself. You know, a lot of times it's, it's like having a premonition, you know, you're thinking of someone you haven't seen in 30 years and then all of a sudden you see them in a grocery store and you say, geez, I was just thinking about yeah. you. Like we're having a premonition is what you were having. And so I started taking those as, oh, I'm, this is going to happen. And it always did, but I would write it down. Yeah. And when it happened, I thought, okay, you know what? I, I'm not nuts. I, I actually thought of these things. <laughs> I wrote them down. It happened. So I'm going to take this as being good as gold. Yeah, that's actually the best advice, I think. Um, that's the advice I give to them as well. Same yeah. thing. Um, it was the, it was the, 
catalyst to help me learn to trust myself. When yes. when a psychic medium told me to write write my thoughts down, it was yeah, just the catalyst. Awesome. It changed everything. So yeah, it great advice. Oh, yeah, great advice. Awesome. Um, okay, so I can't like not ask you about this because you've clearly read for many celebrities and. Yes. You know, without giving up the dirt on them, um, who would be your favorite and why? Oh, my God. I have so many. <laughs> I mean, I have Scott Patrick, who's Hollywood one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, he's interviewed over 6,000 movie stars and actors and everything. But I loved him because he's such a great personality. He's so dynamic. And I could see why he's so world famous, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I love that energy. I really like talking to Penny Ford from Snap. You know, oh, okay. I've got the power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I love it. And Penny lives in Germany, but uh, Penny says it the way it is. She's hilarious. Um, who else? Lorelai McBroom uh, from Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones. Um, she's become actually a very good friend, but I love talking to her because her experiences, her worldly experiences are just... I, mean, I love listening to these people. But oh, I yes. Any Bucky Barrett from, uh, you know, um, Roy Orbison's band. There's been so many people, actors, actresses that I can't mention. Yeah. Um, yeah. And very famous, but they, I can see why they're famous. Yeah. I could, they have such a magnetic, you know, even I, I still remember. And the very first time there was one celebrity, you know, she, I didn't know who she was at first because she gave me a totally fake name. And when she <laughs> got onto the screen in there, you look like somebody like really famous. She goes, I am darling. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> she had like you know, this big towel on her head and she had no makeup on and this great big house coat. And I loved it. Uh, because great. she could be herself, yes. you know? Yeah. yeah, that must but, be so I mean, hard for them, right? Like they, they have a screen persona, which, you know, everybody thinks they know them from that. But they're just normal, yeah. everyday people who they have the have same problems with yeah. you at a different level. They have a lot of stress. Um, the one thing that I've noticed about these people is that it's very hard to be on the road and travel. And it's a very lonely sometimes life a lot oh, of these artists are not in relationships because they can't sustain them so it's very difficult for them um you know for example my friend has been on world tour i think six times since i've known her and the thing is when you're on a bus going from poland to russia and you're freezing and you're sleeping on these buses people don't see that aspect no. of it you no. don't see people, you know, being on tour for a month and being away from their kids and their family and yeah. not being able to, like, talk about what's really bothering them or being in their hotel room for days without wanting to go out because they get bombarded by people. I mean, there's so much to, you know, to that lifestyle yes. that I so understand. It's not as glamorous um, as it looks, yeah. right? really isn't. Yeah. Everybody thinks they need to, well, everybody feels they need, like me, asking the question, we all want a piece, right? Which yes. is kind of a yeah. shame that I even asked the question. <laughs> but people do want a but piece of them. It. I find that very overwhelming. Yeah. Some just want to be left alone. Some love the attention, but depending when. It just all depends on the artist, you know. But I find artists a little different than, let's say, um, you know, a famous author, let's say. Right. You know, someone that's an actor, very different, you yeah. know. Yeah. Very so. Cool. Yeah, so, but I enjoy it. I at first have to like kind of go, okay, I'm a big freaking fan. Um, I love you. So let's get that over with. And now let's go now. Seriously. Yeah, exactly. It's hard. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Look at, I'm talking to you. I get it. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> well, you know, let's, let's get into something because I, I did read um, some interesting stuff about um, that you had posted about life after death. And I wanted yes. to, to give the folks watching this the benefit of that. So could you explain how you see life after death? Oh, my goodness. There's so much to it. <laughs> yeah. How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, yes. I believe that there's an instant body to soul transformation when you die because I, I, I went through it, you know. So the thing is, I always tell people, if you don't remember being born, you'll never remember dying. But I believe that once we pass through, we go to the other side. And there's two different types of spirits for me. There's grounded spirits 
who have not accepted the light right. or people that don't know they're dead or they get like shocked and thrown out of their bodies, you know, blunt force traumas, accidents, that kind of thing. And sometimes they don't realize they're dead, sometimes three, four days, sometimes three, four months because they're yeah. stuck in that pain. But I really work a lot with consciousness when I talk to people and I explain to them is that really the other side is like dream world. It's, it's, it's actually a dream world for me is what I think. And the thing is, I go through this whole big explanation about, um, you know, how consciousness works here on Earth, but how we carry it through to the other side. Right. So I believe that we lose the body. There's no male or female to the other side, but you lose that body and you transform through people immediately right. and you, even though you die alone let's say if I were to drop dead here right now I wouldn't be alone someone would come to get yes. me or I would be greeted because immediately I was greeted by my grandfather my brother who I'd never met and I knew who they were you know everybody on the other side yes. you know um, I believe that spirit is pure energy that we could be in a million places with one thought you know, so it's quite amazing. And I don't believe that there's an ego to the other side. So we kind of leave that behind. So spirits are very highly vibrating, very happy, very energetic. Mm -hmm. And so there's a huge difference between us being here on this planet of tribulation, learning our lessons, you know, and um, those types of things to the other side. Because there's no worry on the other side. There's no ego. There's no problems. There's no there's no bills on the other side. Isn't that greatest thing? Isn't that the greatest thing? Yeah. yeah. It is. Oh, yes. But um, I believe that. But I, I also think that before we come into being, we make agreements with other souls to go through certain life experiences here. Because the soul is, doesn't, as I mentioned, doesn't have an ego, as you all know. And so the soul comes here to learn exactly what it wants and what it doesn't want through emotional experiences, physical experiences, you know, joy, happiness, this, that. Mm -hmm. And the thing is it chooses its soulmates before it comes here. Now, soulmates come in different forms as well, as you all know. Um, so sometimes they're terrible soulmates, sometimes they're good ones. But these are our teachers. Exactly. And although we may not like the lessons that we've chosen here, so I could have, <laughs> chosen, I could have chosen to be sexually abused by a father. And why would I choose something like that? It's yeah. terrible. You know, people say, well, why would I choose that? Yeah. Well, the thing is, the soul is a highly evolved energy. And, and it doesn't have an ego. And it knows what it needs to learn in order to progress to a higher soul level. Yeah. So when I tell people, you know, when you go through, um, the thing is, you'll have a total understanding of your life and everything that you chose to go through and to learn in order to grow as a soul, as in order to go to a higher soul level. You know, so I mean, I could talk about this for hours because I love the subject of <laughs> consciousness. Yeah. When we talk about consciousness, people get to understand the other side a lot more. But the thing is, is to understand that these people never really go away. They're always around. Their energies are always around. It's just the body that's gone. That's right. Yeah. It's like being in a dream. You know, you, you're in a dream. You see from the eyeballs out, but you don't even have, you know, the slightest notion that you're even human. You know? right, right. So it's kind of like being in a dream. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate yeah. that. That's very similar to how I've been shown um, what, like I wouldn't even change any of it, actually. It's pretty much on par with what I've been shown to be the other yeah. side, you know, because I, I lost my brother um, when I was 10, and that set me on a course of really wanting to understand what's this about? What's death? What does that mean? So that was where my journey sort of began, um, really delving deeply into what all that meant. So that's exactly what they've shown me, uh, right on par. Very cool. Well, I should wrap this up soon because we've been talking for a long time here, but I could literally talk for days to you, but I have a limit here, unfortunately. But I do want to make a little announcement because you and I are going to be on the same stage in October yes. 2020 at the Halo yes, Awards. I am so excited about that. Um, it is going to be uh, amazing to, to hear you again speak, but uh, I'm so grateful that I get to, you know, be on par with you there for that event and uh, put on by our good friend Amber Price. That's kind of exciting. But Jay, if, yes. right, if people want to touch base with you, um, I'm going to put your website and uh, your email in the in the link to this video. But do you want to just tell them your site right now? Yes, I'm 
got a few actually, but the main site is mediumjlane.com. So, you know, you can certainly go there and it'll bring you to, you know, a membership site that I have and also a series that I'm working on. So, yeah. That's very cool. I'm excited to see it. Like next time, we'll have to have you on again so we can talk about that series because there's just not enough time. I had these very specific questions I needed to get from you because always intriguing, of course. But um, we'll have you on again, hopefully, when that series is up and running and we'll, you know, like we'll talk about, you know, how that's all playing out. I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up, folks, with saying, you know, after speaking with Jay, we really get a handle on just how close our loved ones are to us. And, you know, they're never far from us. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank you, Jay, for coming on our show today and sharing your wisdom and uh, have a blessed and abundant week, folks, till we see you on the next show. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me as a guest today. I truly enjoyed it. I enjoyed your energy. You're just awesome. And awesome. I'm so looking forward to working with you. I know. I can't wait either. Okay. Have a good day. You too, Liz.